Welcome everybody. We're gonna do a fiddle and guitar workshop. Well, we thought we'd just start all together. Right, first of all, I'm Sammy Lynn. And this is uh, Nadine Landry. And we uh, come from 10 hours northeast of here up on the Gas Bay Peninsula in Quebec. I'm originally from Minnesota, but that's where Nadine's from. And uh, we thought we'd just start all together, just demonstrate <coughs> Uh, maybe three possible tunes we'll try to get through. Might just get through one, might get through two, but maybe three. And uh, she'll teach the same tunes and back up. Uh, just so we can all get together yeah. back at the end and then and just out. try to build a common repertoire a little bit, you know, like in the area. That's, it's always kind of fun, or just wherever, with uh, whoever you play music with. <laughs> um, I was thinking of this one tune from, from Tennessee called uh, The Ocean Waves might be kind of a good one to kick things off with. And I think it's just has two chords, isn't it? Just... It's very happy. Yeah. <laughs> it has all, all two chords. And it's just in the, the key of G, and it has a real repetitive bowing pattern to watch out for when, we de when I demonstrate it. But it also has some really great uh, chord formation. You know, the, I, I played guitar and banjo and you know more rhythm instruments for many many years, you know from the time I was eight until I was eight, 18 when I started the fiddle. You know, so I, I I still think like super rhythmically. So I think that's something that can be hard if you're a fiddle player. You're always thinking melody, 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 and maybe not so much what makes up, you know, what, what three notes make up a chord. In, in the key of G, in, in the case of the key is G, it's a G, a B, and a D. Any combination of those three. Talk to that in your fiddle workshop. Yeah, but I mean, I, so that's, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. All right. Been in the car too long. This one's from Charlie Acuff, great fiddle player. Passed away about 10 years ago. It's neat. It's a, it's a tune I haven't really heard too many people play except to learn it from a, a cassette tape. I don't think it was ever reissued on any other format. It's just Charlie Acuff and then John Hartford playing this beautiful just th three finger banjo behind it. It's just kind of a really neat recording of those two guys. You don't think of John Hartford just playing with too many of the old players like that. Even more doing his own thing. Well, I do anyway. Doing his own thing. And, uh, writing a lot of great songs. But. And the other one in the key of G is one that I got from a uh, fiddle hero of mine named Gary Harrison. And it's called Charlie's Favorite. And this is a great one for the, this one has all three chords. <laughs> and, again, and again, talking about chord formations and stuff, but for the guitar players, this one's just, there's kind of no doubt what the chords are in this one. It's just so clear, like G to C, you know. <laughs>
another one, you know, I don't really hear too too many people play it. I just heard Gary do it at a workshop one time. And he's referring to Charlie Falk. Charlie Falk was a great fiddle player from Southern Illinois who Gary learned a lot of his repertoire from. And the other tune is a real neat one. We call them short little ditties when they're kind of half length. They're not like the full, uh, and I love those kind of tunes. Play a lot of those. They're especially great like fiddle and banjo tunes, kind of get knee to knee and just throw down some short little ditties. And this one's from uh, Luther Davis. It's called Rockin' in Weary Land. It's one we played for about 20 minutes last night, I think. <laughs> And it's in the key of D, but it starts on a big five chord, a big A chord. I want to make a record sometime with those tunes, and it would probably be like 50 tunes, but only half an hour long. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I guess we're going to We're going to separate, locations. and we're just trying to figure out who's going to stay and who's going to go. Who's taking the fiddle? Looks like they're more guitar players, so they all want to stay here. Yeah. Fiddle players can take a hike. <laughs> Get told that all, all the time. <laughs> You can go and decide where you go and then just come back and meet us. Like, yeah, sure. And it just goes like this, like so I'm just gonna do it in the G chord. Just find that that we call it. I call it home base. G with a B above it. Okay, so and I was talking about what makes up chords. So G and then a B above it or anywhere, and then D. So any combination of those makes up a G chord. So the simplest G chord we have is this one. The next one would be B with a D above it. And then you can add the G above that. And then you can put a B above that G, that's home base. You can lose that G with the ring finger and play a D with a B above it. And then you can put a G above that B with the middle finger. And then you can put a D with your ring finger below that G. That's a real nice voicing, that one. Like sometimes, and that, the reason why I think it's so important to know all these positions and just have them as tools, like for any any chord that you're doing, or if it, uh, any any key that you're in, um, and the way it works is you, you, you can count in numbers. And I'm not talking about chord numbers, if you've heard people say like one, four, five, or whatever, but so we just start, like all chords are made out of the one, three, and five. So G, A, B, C, D. So those are the those are the three. Any permutation of those three notes will give you a chord. So let's just do that bowing pattern, and just like every you know, we'll go kind of. I'll do something like just. It doesn't matter. There's no right or wrong. But try to find a different version of 
a G chord. Just we'll do that for a few times through. So. Also a good warm-up exercise, especially like uh, if you haven't played for a while, or you're, maybe you're in a jam and all of a sudden, or you're, you have to play someone else's fiddle, or you just just to get in tune and kind of get your fingers warmed up, just find where all the the key notes will be. So okay, this here's the tune. I'll just play it once through, kind of slowly, and then I'll break it down phrase by phrase. So it's. the wrong tune. <laughs> Three, four. And even real simple bowing pattern, yet it's complicated a little bit because it's syncopated. You hear the beats like this, and it goes. That's a real, real common factor with old time music, this kind of old time music. Every, every country or every community probably has what they call old time music. In Minnesota, old time music was polka music. <laughs> I ran into someone from Minnesota when I said I was oh yeah I was playing playing old time music now and they're like what you're in a polka band <laughs> like, like, no but uh, it'd be kind of fun though <laughs> so three four. different, more shuffly, than back to the pattern, but here it's a little shuffly. So just that first phrase of the B part is only where it kind of gets a little shuffly. But then it goes right back to it, that, that pattern, that down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. So. Okay, so the first phrase starts on a real, just, just heavy D. And I'll even, that's one way to expand some of these tunes that maybe don't have a lot of notes, is you can just take this, and you can go. You know, double it from below, just like a lot of units and stuff. So. Starts on the G, gonna leave my first finger there. It goes to the A, but I'm gonna double it. Okay. The third phrase starts with a three note slur, but the same bowing, and it's gonna start on the F sharp on the D string. It's gonna peel it off to the open D. Okay, that's a C note, but it's not a C chord. It's like the seventh. It's like it makes the D a seven. It sounds dissonant, but it's just how it is. And 
here's the last phrase. And it's just the E, but again, I'm gonna double it. It's not like a big, obvious thing, but it's just like, it's almost like when, you're, when your pinky gets to that unison, you kind of just abandon it. It's just like, it's almost like an ornament. It's not a full, that wouldn't be wrong, but that's what I'd end up doing. Okay, so here's the very last one. I'll just play it really clearly. It just goes. Back to home base. starts in the G. Third phrase in the F sharp, peeling off to the D. Last phrase starts in the high E. Just the last one. time we're keeping it. That's kind of the magic of, of, of bowing this kind of music is that you know you, you has this underlying rhythm that we laid out with this pattern but then you're doing different stuff with your left hand. That's what I think kind of makes it really polyrhythmic and gives it a lot of people ask like what gives it that push and pull and it, it comes with syncopation and also real rhythmic bowing over melodic, you know, different things melodically. All right, that's the whole A part. repeat it, you go. Pretty, pretty doable. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, here's the B part. It's gonna go. It's gonna do a three note slur. Three note slurs are super common. It's gonna start on the B, and we were, we just finished in that home base, or we're already at that B, and then you go like. Just gonna go. See, like, just try to minimize the movement. Like once I get that D, plant it. So that's a make. Yeah, that D below it. You got it's a nice. Uh, Second phrase. You could put that B below it to make a nice chord. 
And then the third phrase, like many, many tunes, same as the first. And here's the last phrase, quite simple. You hear the difference? The, the second phrase was dun, 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 dun. This one is just da 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 da. Okay? Let's try the whole B part together. So when I learn tunes, it drives uh, Nadine kind of crazy, but uh, what I do is I, I'll put it on about 75% speed on a loop, sometimes just the first phrase for about a half an hour or like, but uh, main goal is, you know, put it on when I'm, you know, working on a project or, you know, doing dishes or, you know, that kind of thing or the stuff you do at home. And, uh, but the kind of goal is for me, is to like when I actually pick up my fiddle to, to play it like I already know it like I can sing it I can hum it and many many fiddlers actually learn that way from one of their parents maybe the, the fiddle skipped a generation and they'll be learning a tune and then, like you know their mother will be like no 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 daddy played it like da 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 you know like really correcting you know because you don't have to have an instrument to know what the tune's supposed to be like so just for fun let's just uh I'll play the chords and let's just try to sing it like So that's that's kind of the idea that high parts a little high for me, but but also I think it's really important to have the tunes in your head that way so well that you know you might you might run into somebody who plays this tune in the key of D or something. You don't want to be totally locked into the how you think of the melody and it being right here. And that's especially translates to if you're playing behind a singer. You know, if, like maybe you heard, uh, you know, maybe you heard uh, George Jones sing this song in G, and then you hear, you know, your friend who's got a really high voice wanted, to, you know, George could sing all over the place, but they wanted to do it in D or something. You know, it's good to be able to, to kind of, you know, recognize. You know, I know that's kind of going off on a tangent, but. <laughs> 
I think it's, it's important to kind of to be versatile that way, and I think that comes from really knowing the music in your head first. All right, let's try it a little bit more. I don't, I don't really have the bowing on that first phrase in the B part. Okay, so it's, it's got a really, we call it like the Melvin Wine ending, like he would end tons of tunes. So that's how that one ends. So it goes, so instead of like a dip, like a, there's all kinds of different ways you can, you know, fiddlers end phrases, different shuffles. But this one is goes, and then, you know, instead of going like, like a syncopated shuffle or even like a standard shuffle, None of those would be wrong, but like that's kind of the. I think that gives it this cool lift, and also when you listen to a lot of the senior fiddle players, like source um, recordings, you end up hearing a lot. Like your your brain ends up putting more notes than are actually in there. Like it seems like there's just there was they were done with more vigor. I mean, maybe a person's repertoire was you know, maybe. 20 tunes and they're all totally regional so there's going to be all these little things to sort of pick at them and to me that's that's one like melvin wine for sure west virginia fiddle player he would play whole tunes that had this so it's like and then you know you want to hear or something, you know, or it's just, but it's just, and then I'm, I'm throwing that little G on top. Gary Harrison called those uh, pulses, or they could call them punches. Mm. Oh, and you kind of feel it right there a little bit, like right in here, like a little <laughs> emphasis. Uh, and I throw those in all over the place, even to, like, you know, some of those are, like even right here in the beginning, instead of just going, sometimes I'll go, like a down, a down punch or a down pulse. Just to kind of, it just livens things up a little bit. And, Kind of gives individual flavor to to uh, the tunes, and a lot of times I've learned from fiddle players where I heard a recording of them and I learned it, which I swore it was exactly perfect. And then I'll meet them and play it in person and realize, like, oh wow, that wasn't a shuffle; it was actually like a you know, instead of a you know, kind of a thing like that. I mean, it's just kind of neat to hear what people come up with, and, and it usually. Uh, there's no right or wrong way to bow stuff, but one thing for certain is that, you know, with senior fiddle players, that's what Gary always called the, the, the old, older generations, um, is that they were always consistent and the bowing always worked out. You know, they could say, oh, they're playing it backwards or whatever, but it's not backwards if they end things the right way. And <laughs>
And Charlie Hakeb is a total character. You can hear him the second he talks, you just know he's just like telling a fib or whatever. But, um, there's lots of great footage of him on YouTube. Left-handed fiddle player, real kind of hunched over as he got older. But for this one, out of nowhere, I remember listening to the recording the first time and just like, oh yeah, I've got to learn this tune. And all of a sudden he goes like, it's awful lots of fun, awful lots of fun, awful lots of fun, drinking wine and beer. <laughs> it's like, like, wow, with uh, deep, heavy lyrics for ocean waves. Oh, another story about this tune just shows uh, the mystery of where all these fiddle tunes come from. Do you ever think about that? Like, where do these tunes all come from and, and these titles and stuff? But uh, we played in... Liverpool over in England and we played this tune and everybody in the crowd started looking at each other and <laughs> laughing and apparently this melody was the melody that's been forever on the carousel at the little <laughs> carnival but as a jig though so and then I looked up I, I did some research and sure enough there's an old string band from like the late 20s uh, to go back and get their name and they had like tenor banjo they had all this stuff big huge string band and they played it as a jig so it was like you know unmistakable melody but like that was what was at the at the carousel just like I remember the, this I couldn't figure out why this whole crowd was like laughing at this this when we you know at that tune but they were all completely familiar with it for generations let's play a little bit faster one, two, three, Sometimes I'll that little last G. Instead of just going. I kind of like to add those little little ornaments and notes here and there. Oh, wow, we only have like five minutes. <laughs> Let's do that. The, the, the tune Charlie's favorite, I can do like a clear recording of it maybe if you want. But it also has that pretty much that same bowing pattern throughout. So that other, it'd be kind of fun to do that other tune. Um, Rocking in a weary land. So. Is this Charlie's favorite? Yeah, this is Charlie's favorite. Yeah. So again, it's from the Charlie Falk, uh, but I got it from Gary. Two, three, four. So it, it shares, like the second and fourth phrases are exactly the same. So uh, yeah, I'll just play it even slower.
this is a great tune to kind of really unclutter your bowing. If, like that's one the, one thing I learned from all my fiddle heroes that I've learned so much from, whether it's in person or from recordings that they've passed passed on, is that their bowing was always so uncluttered. You know, it was very intentional. And those like what I mean there is like you know just not extra shuffles and but this one's really great for that like especially Though you're kind of like, what am I doing? And then it just works out perfectly, you know. And I think that's that's sort of that's a big step in in um, in, in your fiddling if you can kind of feel like you're getting to that point with tunes. Kirk Suffin is a master player at that. He's you know master at the the round peak stuff. But then you hear him play rags and stuff, and it's just like that old like Charlie Poole stuff. Posey Roarer was the fiddle player. Just really beautiful stuff. So let's um maybe when we're up there we'll uh. Usually I tune my, I would tune my um, low string to an A, but let's just leave it for now. We don't have much time. So this one, it's in the key of D. And it's gonna start on the high E. And again, I'm, I like to double that. So. That's the first, first phrase. Gonna have this this sort of theme that's gonna keep happening, and it goes. You hear that's kind of rubbery, like. get back into the third phrase, which is the same as the first phrase, like most tunes, you go, you do a little hitch in the bowing. Okay, let's just do what we've done so far. So it just starts off straight. part and they talk about a reoccurring theme here it is so it's the, it's the last same as the a parts last phrase so now we just got to learn this okay it's kind of a cool little riff but only a couple same thing it's that same ending with the, the double up and then the last phrase that high bass is really cool because you when you double that you have a low A so you kind of have this
first race always starts with that hitch. So it's like... Like when I first taught it, it was just... Like that's what you're going for, but it's just to get there, so it's like... So it's like... Just the way it works out is like... So the, the, the phrase previous ends on a long down bow. And you could square it off and go. Well, I can't really because the way the phrasing, where it, the way it flows back in, that's, that's what kind of makes it unique. It's not like, it's not backwards bowing. There's a lot of, uh, you know, it, for many, many tunes, it's like that, it's just a rule, all phrases start in a down bow, but this one kind of shows why a lot of them don't. Can we practice that transition? Yeah. Long so, down bow to the... so it's here's the, here's the the fourth phrase or the sec. There's only two mm -hmm. phrases in each part. Setting yourself up for the big ease, you know. The... Yeah. Uh, when I, I don't know why I was doing that, but we, we call those Ashby notes. I'm a big fan of John Ashby's recordings, and there's some of these real standard tunes where you know you heard it a million people play it and heard it all for many many years, then all of a sudden you hear. It's just like, what? I think it just kind of showed a sense of humor or something. Well, let's go uh, play with the guitar players. I'm just starting, because it's actually, it'd be like. Potatoes are not the easiest thing. I've seen so many players play, go like. And like, it's like, wait, it's supposed to be the. But it's important to really get them down because you'll, like, if you're playing a dance, you'll get the tempo from the, the collar, and then the filler internalizes it. And you're gonna do it. How do I do that? All right. We're ready. All right, here we go. Here's gonna be the tempo. Oh, that's a really good one.
Nailed it. Awesome. Yeah, Sounds sharp great. Little, <laughs> sharp little ditties. All night long. <laughs> Maybe we'll try to play that for the square dance. Uh, Y'all sticking around for the square dance? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's going to be fun. That's a beautiful spot for a dance and show. All right, let's do uh, Ocean Waves. The one that just has the G and the C. And if you want to sing along, uh, the lyrics are, it's awful lots of fun, it's awful lots of fun, it's awful lots of fun, drinking wine and beer. <laughs> Pretty deep stuff, but it's a true story. Yeah. Fiddler's, Fiddler's Tale. those tunes, you know, from that tune in particular, I think what's, what starts to happen when you start to learn tunes and really get them down really solidly, whether it's on any, any instrument, is that you just start to hear a lot of, oh, that phrase reminds me of that phrase from that tune. Or, uh, like, that bowing pattern is just like that other tune. You start to have these little tools in your arsenal, like, kind of, 
It's like learning a language. At first, it just sounds like a bunch of random gibberish, and you, know, you start to pick out phrases here and there that are recognizable. Yeah. All right, well, uh, I guess we'll just give a few minutes. We'll start the singing workshop. Just maybe a couple minutes, guys. Yeah.